Hello everyone, I'm back with round two of a question and answer. So I'm gonna to try to go through a few more questions that you all had for me. Um, I thought I would start with a couple of questions that maybe had some quick answers and then we can go into some that might require a little more. So the first one was, how do I protect my Compostela? So the Compostela is the certificate that you get at the end of the Camino, kind of the certificate of completion. And it's a piece of paper and it can really get wrecked in your pack. So this person was asking, is there a way to protect it from getting damaged? And there is, um, you have the option to buy a tube to put your Compostela in. And so these were a couple of euros, maybe three euros, and they're pretty standard to be sold where you get your Compostela. And so so it goes into the pack and really protects your certificate. Another question I got was, how much Spanish do I speak? And is it possible to get by on the Camino without speaking much or any Spanish? So I don't speak Spanish. Um, I couldn't even call myself conversational. I can understand a little bit. And that's all that I picked up from walking to my Caminos and spending a number of days in Spain. Um, I feel like I kind of have the Camino lingo down. So I know a lot of words that can help me when I'm on the Camino. So ordering food, checking into an albergue or a hotel and asking about a bed, um, talking about really basics like where I'm from, how I'm doing, greetings, that kind of thing. And I would really encourage all all pilgrims to try to learn a lot of that you know some you're going to kind of pick up when you're there but I think it's pretty easy before you're heading out to the Camino and to Spain um, to just work on kind of recognizing some words and kind of practicing the pronunciation so you can at least make an effort when you're there I would say that if you're on the Camino Frances the most popular route uh, it's not necessary to know Spanish Again, it's important to learn a little bit um, and to try to make an effort, uh, but really all along the route, you're gonna find more places and services where people there can communicate in English. Um, things may be translated into English or there's so many other pilgrims that you can usually find someone to help translate for you. So on the Camino Frances, I didn't find my lack of Spanish to make the walk too challenging. Um, on future Caminos, I think I've just gotten more comfortable and confident with walking a Camino. And so on some of the less traveled Camino routes, um, I'm going through areas of Spain where hardly any English is spoken. And in those cases, I'm able to get by. It's not always the easiest, but it's fine. I'm able to make it through, but I always wish that I could communicate better or would know more Spanish. I would say though on the popular Camino routes, I if you don't speak Spanish, I wouldn't let that stop you from going on the walk. I would say, you know, just practice while you can and try to get to recognize some words um, and so that you can make an effort to speak a little, but otherwise I would say go for it. Another question I got was how much does my backpack weigh and do I usually weigh it before I go on the Camino? And um, before my first Camino, I paid a lot of attention to that. I really tried to keep my pack weight down. They really recommend about 10% of your body weight um, to be like the weight of your pack. So to really try to carry no more than 10% of your body weight. That's kind of hard to do. Um, I think it's a little bit easier for me because I go in the summer uh, and I don't have to take as many layers. I don't have to take maybe a heavier sleeping bag or sleep sack. But it's still a little challenging to keep it to 10%. Uh, on my first Camino though, I did pack really light. I weighed my bag before I went. I think excluding water and food, it might have been 13 pounds, maybe even 12 pounds. So that was pretty good. And then with water and food, um, it, it definitely weighed more, I would say, but not a lot more. Um, so that was a pretty good weight. But I think then maybe before the second Camino, I also waited to try to get a sense of, you know, am I overpacking? Am I bringing too much? Now I, again, cause I've done so many Caminos, I kind of know what I can handle. You know, the lighter the pack, the better, but I can walk with a little more weight. And I've added a few things to my pack that I wasn't carrying on the first Camino. So my pack is now heavier. Um, I could only guess though about how much it weighs now. And it also depends on how much water and food I'm carrying. Sometimes I'm carrying a lot of food and a lot of snacks. Sometimes I eat it down and I need to restock. So my pack will be lighter. Um, but it might be like 16, 17, 18 pounds now, something around that. I think for a lot of pilgrims though, if you're starting out, it's nice to weigh your pack and kind of get a sense of how much you're carrying before you set off, uh, just so that you don't overpack and start out with way too heavy of a pack because it's really easy to do that. 
Um, another question that I really liked was what item do I bring out of tradition or good luck? And I have a few that I've carried over the years. I'm just going to share one today. And it is this little wolf necklace. Let me bring that up closer to the camera. So it's a little wolf. And this was given to me about three, three and a half years ago. It was after my 2019 Camino Aragones. I had just finished that part of the Camino and I met a pilgrim from Italy and I was waiting for a bus and he was waiting for the post office to open to mail some things ahead. Um, and we just kind of ended up at the same cafe and we're drinking coffee and talking. Um, and at the end of the conversation, he rooted through his pack and said, I have something for you. I have something for you. And he gave me this necklace and he said, you know, because I walk alone, the wolf will kind of act as a protection. And so I wore this necklace every day of the rest of the Camino that year. So from the Aragones, I went up to the Norte and did a section of that. And I really loved having the necklace. And then I brought it on, you know, the next two subsequent Caminos in 2021. And last year I had it with me. I didn't wear it because I don't know. I think it just kind of felt that it was not more special on that first Camino, but I really wanted to wear it after I received it. Uh, but I just really liked having it on these past few Caminos. So I just kind of keep it in my pack and it, it feels like this extra layer of protection in a way. Um, or maybe even good luck. I like the idea of good luck too. So that is something that I carry with me. Let's see. I got a question about couples on the Camino. So if you're going to walk with someone, maybe whether it's a friend or a partner, do I have any advice for two people who are walking the Camino together, especially if they have kind of different experience levels, different fitness levels, what can make it a good experience so that both people enjoy their Camino? And this, this again is a question that I could go into a lot of detail on. Um, I also maybe am not the expert because I walk alone. <laughs> so I think talking to couples who walk the Camino, you know, that would be a great resource to answer this. But um, I have shared a few parts of a couple different Caminos with a family member and a friend. Um, and I've observed a lot and just, and kind of know a lot about dynamics. So I'll try to like kind of answer what I can to this question. I think the most important thing, if you're going to travel with someone and walk a Camino, um, it's communication. So really communicating before you head out about what your expectations are. Um, this, you know, it's not going to solve everything, but it's really going to help sort of maybe prevent some issues. Or if things come up on the Camino, you may have already talked about different situations. So you'll kind of know your approach and how to handle them when you're on the Camino rather than being blindsided by it. So if you have two people with very different experience levels, so let's say one person maybe has walked a Camino before or they've done backpacking, they do a lot of hiking and someone else hasn't done a lot of that. I think it's going to be really important beforehand to talk about what you each expect of the experience. So do you have some common goals in mind? Um, do you want to, you know, is one person looking for a real physical challenge, but the other one is looking for more like cultural highlights and really taking their time. So you really want to see how each of you wants to do the walk. And then as ever, try to come to a bit of a compromise and decide how you're going to do it together. So I think that is something that when you're traveling with someone else and doing something like the Camino, it's not going to be 100% your maybe most ideal experience. And that's just the reality of it. It really can't be unless you are so directly aligned with the other person you're walking with. Most likely you're going to have to compromise on your experience, but you're going to get a lot out of walking with someone and a lot of things that maybe a solo walker isn't going to get. But I think going over some of the stuff ahead of time is going to help. So I would go through maybe some different scenarios and talk about how you're going to handle it. So whether, you know, you're heading out for a day, do you expect to walk 100% of the stage together? Is it okay if you separate? Is it okay if you completely walk separately, but then agree on a town to meet up on? Do you pick a few points along the day stage to stop, check in with each other, take a break, and then separate? Does one person walk slower so that they can spend more time with the other person if your pace is different? I think those are important things to talk about. Um, just talking about comfort level. Do you both want to stay in albergues? Do you want private rooms? Do you want to mix? Um, as stuff comes up, like if someone gets injured, what's the plan? You know, will that person, if they have to stop their Camino or take a few days off, will they bust ahead while 
their partner continues walking or will you both stop together? So I think really communicating on those things before you go is going to help as some of the stuff will probably inevitably come up when you're on the Camino. I also think it's really, really smart to go on some practice walks and hikes together, but do a couple of big days. And so try to plan for a 10 or 12 mile practice hike with your packs and with your packs pretty loaded. And in that way, it's almost like you're kind of troubleshooting ahead of time. You'll really get a sense of like, oh, we were able to walk that whole day together and we both did pretty well. Our pieces kind of match each other. You might see where one person loses steam after a couple hours, where the other person can keep going. Maybe someone is great with the uphill, but they have a lot of trouble with downhill. Maybe for someone, the pack weight is just too much and they're really thinking, I think I'm gonna wanna ship stuff ahead and use um, a package or a luggage service. So I think making sure you do a lot of that ahead of time when you're walking with someone else um, could be really important and really helpful. And then again, I would just say when you're on the Camino, really communicate with each other and remember that you're there to share the experience. And so it may not be the Camino of your dreams. You may not be able to do it exactly how you want it, but that you're going to get so much out of being there with someone else. Um, and if it's a disaster, then... <laughs> You've learned that lesson. You know, I think sometimes it can be hard to walk with other people and we can't always predict maybe some of the challenges that could come up. Um, I know for me, for the most part, I do really like walking alone, but the times that I have shared walking with other people have been really great, but I definitely learned a few things when I walked with others um, and not just people I met along the way, but when a friend came out to meet me and my cousin joined me for part of a Camino one year, um, I... I'm sure I wasn't perfect and I probably didn't communicate as much as I should have, but I did kind of learn that I had to adjust kind of maybe not having quite the Camino that I would have if I were on my own, um, but that there was so much value in sharing it with someone else. Okay, so another question I got was about why I don't wear a poncho or use a backpack rain cover. Um, and I do actually have a rain cover for my backpack, but I don't wear a poncho. I um, use a raincoat when I travel. And I think this question probably came up, I'm gonna guess from like my last few series of videos, I walked in the rain for a couple of days and probably shared that I got pretty wet. Um, like my clothes got wet, some stuff in my pack got wet. And I think there are a few reasons for that. So when I walked the Camino Portugues last spring, my first day was in a lot of rain and I got soaked. Um, but some of this was that it was, you know, it wasn't a light rain. It wasn't raining for just like an hour. It was raining the whole time I was walking. And I was also along the coast and there was a lot of wind. And so in that case, the rain was just kind of blowing sideways at me and it was getting into every possible place that it could, just drenching everything. The rain like collected on the bottom, like, I got into my um, pack cover, the rain pack cover, and like collected in a puddle at the bottom so that the bottom of my pack was like sitting in a little pool of water. And then it soaked, like it just kind of bled up through the bottom of my pack, soaking in like so much <laughs> in my backpack. Um, so there's that. Also, I think my rain jacket is not great. So I had a rain jacket I bought for my first Camino. It was a white one. I really loved it. It was a little more expensive. Uh, but after a number of years, uh, it started to just kind of wear down and the waterproofing started to go. I bought some special detergent. I tried to wash it to kind of re-waterproof it, but that didn't work. Um, and I kind of discovered this right before I left on the Camino in 2021. And so I was scrambling just a little bit to buy a new rain jacket. And I just went out and bought something. It wasn't that expensive. And it's okay in a light rain or again, if it's just raining for a little bit. But I found that when I'm walking a lot, um, I don't know, I guess, I don't know if rain is getting in. I don't know if some of it's because it's like humid when I'm walking into the summer and I'm sweating a lot. And so like, I am I just feel like I'm getting wet underneath my rain jacket, but I just found that this rain jacket's not quite as good. Um, it's not very long. And so I think that if I bought another rain jacket, I would just get a longer one. It would cover me more. I think that would help. Um, as to why I don't wear a poncho, I don't know. I keep thinking I should try one. Some of it is, I just like having a rain jacket. I kind of like that it's an extra layer. It can act as a windbreaker. I like the look of it better, but I do think a poncho can be very functional and it can really help protect against getting your pack wet. I think when it's raining a lot, one of my problems is, you know, I've got 
the pack cover on my backpack and my rain jacket on, but then rain just kind of like goes right down my back, kind of in between those layers and it can get on the back of my backpack kind of making things wet. And a poncho eliminates that. I think a poncho can really th keep things a lot more dry. So I don't know, maybe I'll try a poncho. Please, that's one thing in the comments, you know, chime in if you're like team rain jacket or team poncho, because I know pilgrims can be pretty divided on, on that question. All right, so the question of bed bugs came up several times, and there are a lot of resources out there for dealing with bed bugs. So I will say there are bed bugs on the Camino, for sure. Um, I personally, as far as I know, have not experienced bed bugs. I haven't gotten bitten. Maybe I have and haven't noticed, but I haven't had any bad reactions where I like look down at my ankles or my arms and I'm like covered in bites and think like, what was that? I just got eaten by something in the night. That hasn't happened to me. And I've walked a lot of Caminos, so I should knock on wood. <laughs> I might be lucky with that, but I haven't had any experiences with bed bugs. I have walked with some people who have gotten bed bugs. I've met pilgrims that have gotten bad bed bug bites. I've seen a couple of bed bugs, not on my bed, but again, people I've walked with. Um, one girl I was walking with in my first Camino, she discovered bites and we arrived at the next albergue and the hospitalera had her spread out her sleeping bag and check for bed bugs and she found a little bed bug on the sleeping bag. So they're out there. Um, I would say here that you know, I'd, I personally, I try not to think too hard about it because it's ooh, it makes my skin crawl when I do think about it. Uh, I try to remember that there are so many people walking the Camino and we're not talking about the majority of people who, who encounter bed bugs. So while they're out there, it's not a guarantee that you're going to run into them. Um, some people will treat their packs and their sleeping bags or sleeping bag liners with permethrin. Um, and that is a spray that can help prevent bed bugs that works for some people. I've never done that, but again, I haven't had problems with bed bugs. Probably if I do encounter bed bugs, it might change my approach and I might try to treat my stuff with something that can help prevent them. But um, so far, I just, I kind of just hope for the best. Um, I know that there are some pilgrims when they, especially if they sleep in albergues, even if they're in the hotels and pensions, they'll check their mattress before they um, decide on staying there for the night or before they kind of set up their bed and put their sleeping bag down. Um, they just really inspect the mattress and the pillow for any sign of bugs. So you can certainly do that too if you're a little concerned. All right, and then I think maybe the last question we're gonna talk about today, and it's one that I really liked a lot, and that is... As a pilgrim, how do you walk through the pain um, that you might encounter when you're on a Camino? So that could be like blisters. I think this person asked the question, kind of cited, you know, a toenail that's falling off, you know, knowing that there is going to be some pain on a pilgrimage, you know, this really long walk day after day, we're probably going to encounter some physical pain. How do you kind of push through that and still really enjoy your experience and want to be out there walking day after day? And I think for me, the best way that I can answer it is that you just do and you endure and that it's pretty incredible to kind of learn what your body can handle and what you can push through and still have a really great time. Now, when we're talking about pain, you know, there are some limits here and there's some differences between the pain of like a blister versus maybe an infected blister that could be causing a lot more trouble or something like tendonitis or really some kind of injury that could be more serious and that either could prevent you from continuing or where if you go to a medical center or a hospital or a doctor, they might tell you you need to stop and rest for a few days, wait for the situation to heal before you continue. So I'm not going to say that as a pilgrim, if you experience pain, you just need to push through it and keep going. And that's part of the experience because it's not always. I think that's when you need to listen to your body. If you have concerns, go get something checked out. Take a few days off. I think for other pains, though, especially for me, when I think about the times I've walked with blisters, it's it is it's interesting to think about how I no, maybe when I start off in the morning that like, right, I have this big blister growing on the bottom of my foot and that every time I take a step, I'm going to be stepping on that blister and it's going to be causing me pain. And I have walked like that for several days, <laughs> my second Camino. Um, yeah. How do you like start with that in the morning mentally knowing that your entire walk of, you know, I'm walking 20 kilometers and every step is going to be painful. How do I do that? How do I wake up the next day and do it again? 
And I, again, it goes back to that, that answer of you, you just do it. You kind of take the pain as part of that experience and you endure it and you get through. You, you know, I think <laughs> when I think of the days when I did walk on that blister, I do remember some of the pain of it. I remember, you know, they weren't my most favorite stages of the Camino, but I also really remember good moments from those days. I can remember running into my friend Christine at a bar and we shared a coffee together. I remember just before I arrived at one of the albergues, there was a little stretch of walking on the beach. And I remember I took my shoes and socks off and might not have been smart <laughs> with a blister on the bottom of my foot and walking in the sand, but I did it anyway. But I just, I have this photo and I'm standing there and I am so happy and I have such a big smile on my face because I loved where I was. And, and I remember I look at that photo and think like, yeah, I was, I was in pain then. I just walked a whole stage on this not great blister, but I also was having the time in my life. And I think it's kind of part of this experience. It is such, you know, something like the Camino is such a physical experience that there are going to be some aches and pains. And it's pretty remarkable to kind of learn what you can get through. I think it shows your strength. I think it shows your endurance. Um, I think it shows some fortitude. And for me, it's a really kind of neat part of the experience too, just to kind of see like what my body is capable of. Now, I think an entire Camino, whether that's a week or two weeks or a month, every day in pain would be a lot. And so I can't speak to that. I, you know, have had a few stages where I've been physically uncomfortable or walking in some pain, but it's not something that's lasted a long time. And then for the more serious stuff, that's something different. I, you know, a few years ago I had food poisoning and I had to stop and I had to take I, two days, three days off from walking because it was bad and I couldn't, I couldn't walk with that. So, um, and, and I'll also say that part wasn't fun. I didn't enjoy that part of my Camino at all. I, I didn't really look for the silver linings. I just chalked that up to I got sick while I was traveling and that's never fun. So that's something a little bit different. But I think when we're talking about some of the aches and pains of being a pilgrim, I think it's something that you do push through and you see as part of the experience. And ultimately, it's just one part of the experience and not the entire thing. Okay, well, that is the Q&A for today. I still have more questions to answer, so I will just keep going with a part three soon. Again, add a few more questions down below and I'd be happy to try to answer them. So I hope everyone is doing well and I'll be back soon. Buen Camino. Popular route. So it's, you know, you don't need Spanish to walk. Um, there's so much noise from the guy in the apartment above me. I think I'm gonna record this later.